Kia ora anō, everyone. Um, welcome to another lunchtime mobile health webinar on this cold and windy day. I hope you are all set for an interesting hour. My name is Pauline Proud. I'm working with Mobile Health, and I'd like to introduce your speaker today. Today we have John Davies. John's going to talk to you about trauma screening. And John is a registered mental health nurse in the Specialist Mental Health Services in Canterbury DHB. He's worked exclusively in the mental health field since 1999, when he started practicing in Northland, before moving to Navata Hospital in Nelson. He then worked in Te Whare Manaaki Medium Secure Unit until 2010, and then he moved to the Forensic Community Team until 2019. And after that, he shifted to Youth Forensic and is now currently a registered nurse mental health specialist, as I said before, with Canterbury DHB, and also works as an on-call in an on-call role for crisis resolution. So obviously John has heaps of experience and, and I'm sure you're looking forward to hearing his presentation. Welcome, John. Oh, well, thank you, Pauline. Well, thank you for the uh, lovely introduction. And um, now I just have to live up to that with my presentation. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for joining me. It is indeed um, pretty cold and miserable here in Christchurch. So I hope you're all tucked up cosily wherever you are with a cup of tea and some cake and um, ready for my presentation. So um, I'm going to be doing a, uh, this webinar on trauma-informed care, which is becoming more and more of a mainstream sort of uh, care philosophy. And I'm just going to start with a quote from um, uh, Riemann, which says, the ex expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. And essentially, um, the idea is, is that our environment has enormous impact on uh, our well-being. So essentially, trauma-informed care is acknowledging the impact of the past. Uh, and the neatest and most concise way of thinking about it is a paradigm shift from what is wrong with you to uh, what has happened to you. Um, which I think is a, a much more compassionate and understanding framework. Um, it's sort of like the idea of, you know, moving from that idea of why can't this person just stop smoking? Why can't they lose weight? Why can't they take better care of themselves? Um, and I think it is a warmer, kinder, more emphatic, empathetic way of thinking, which immediately puts you in a, in a better mind frame to help this person. Um, and I think that sort of paradigm shift in thinking is kind of, if that's the only thing you take away from this webinar, um, that, that's a terrific start in terms of trauma-informed care. So, and it really underpins pretty much everything um, that this webinar is about. So uh, essentially, trauma-informed care is a shift from what is wrong with you to what has happened to you. So, in terms of the New Zealand context, um, trauma is common, uh, far more common than I think uh, people realise. Um, so this uh, comes from uh, TAPO, which is a, a workforce development organisation uh, for uh, mental health and addiction services. And they talk, they generally, this is the stats that they put up, five people in the general population, uh, seven out of 10 Māori, eight out of 10 in prison, and nine out of 10 who have accessed mental health services. Um, so um, now my background, as Pauline said, has been in forensic psychiatry, so I've had considerable impact with, sorry, considerable contact with both the general, um, with the prison population as well as the uh, mental health population. And if anything, those figures, particularly for the prison population, uh, ring a little bit low to me. However, but whether what the actual figure it is, it is generally pretty high. Um, it is generally that sort of level. The youth justice facilities, um, which I used to provide psychiatric liaison and input to, 
um, almost certainly mirror the adult um, stats, but again, possibly higher. So um, what you can take away from that is that there is a really good chance that you will be seeing somebody uh, within your general workplace who has experienced considerable trauma in their back in their uh, in their background. If you work with a large scale Maori population, it is much higher again. If you work with people who come in uh, contact with mental health services in the prison system, it is an almost uh, certainty. So being aware of trauma uh, trauma informed care is um, going to add to your practice considerably. So just looking at some uh, definitions. So acute trauma is a single event or circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically and emotionally harmful or threatening. Okay, so, and that is generally a uh, sort of a one-off event, um, although, which can, so for example, the Canterbury earthquakes. So that would be a, an acute trauma event um, so, but the ongoing uh, aftershocks would come under um, more of a complex trauma. So complex trauma uh, describes people who have experienced repeated insta instances of the same type of trauma over a period of time or multiple types of trauma. So, for example, there was the initial uh, earthquake in February, but, uh, and some people coped with that pretty well, whereas others uh, didn't. So for example, um, my mum, in the on the day of the earthquake, she was in a supermarket and uh, describes the experience in great detail, talks about the incredible noise of both the earthquake and the crashing of uh, food, pro you know, things coming off the shelves, the screaming of people who are terrified, the, um, uh, and the visual was quite traumatic as well. So, you know, just the, the absolute chaos there of, of uh, in the aisles of the supermarket of uh, broken bottles and uh, people trapped under piles of uh, displays. And then there was the, um, the, uh, the, the trauma of trying to get out of a, of a building that had a... Um, an electric door. So while waiting for the the staff to be able to open that because the power had gone off. So she she suffered what you'd call uh, acute trauma, in that she had quite a, a strong sort of PTSD type reaction. Um, compare that to, for example, my mother-in-law, whose experience was very similar, who um, had no trauma at all. She was again, she was also in the supermarket, but her response to it. Uh, was quite different. She sort of basically walked home um, thinking about how she was going to make lunch. So um, obviously, so that people take uh, experience trauma very, very differently. And uh, so, so, but so there's the acute trauma and the complex trauma is the more ongoing stuff. So, um, for example, in my role as a duly authorised officer on the um, crisis resolution team, about three years after the earthquakes, we started seeing people uh, who had gone through the initial earthquake, done quite well, but then uh, the ongoing trauma of, uh, of aftershocks, of having to repeatedly dig out their houses from uh, liquefaction, uh, the stress of trying to go through complex uh, insurance claims, it just wore them out. And then they then presented to mental health services. So we started seeing quite a cohort of quite different people that would normally present to uh, mental health services. Uh, and that was a result of what you, that, that more complex trauma. Now, there is a, a third type of trauma, which is much more relevant to um, to, to people working uh, with traumatized people, and this is known as secondary trauma. Um, is, and this is resulting from exposure to, um, uh, to other people's trauma. It's also known as vicarious tra trauma. And the best way of thinking about it is it, it's that stuff that gets in. It's just the constant repetition of um, 
people's uh, experiences, particularly uh, of childhood trauma. Um, so, and this is a highly individual thing. So, for example, um, working in the prison, I would often hear uh, stories of their uh, terrible upbringings, and that certainly affected me. But for me, it was even worse, for example, when uh, I was working with youth experience and the trauma was still actively uh, happening. So uh, that secondary trauma is an important aspect of trauma-informed care because it's about main, ensuring that the workforce who are trying to um, care for traumatised people and, and assist traumatised people uh, are the not, themselves not traumatised by the experience. Um, and the way really around that is obviously is through supervision and, you know, talking to colleagues about what you're experiencing. Um, so now just moving on to um, the more specific uh, incidences of, of trauma and how that impacts on people, I'm going to quickly look at a study from 1998 um, and this was quite a groundbreaking study in the United States, and it's called the, as you can see, the relationship of childhood abuse and household dysfunction to many of the leading causes of death in adults, uh, the adverse childhood experience study. Uh, so the term there, you'll see A study, and that stands for adverse childhood events. And this was a, a groundbreaking study, and it re really erased all doubt about what social workers have been saying since the 1970s, really, that the background that uh, children grow up in has a huge impact on their physical and mental health. Um, so this particular study was based in San Diego, um, and what made this study so uh, groundbreaking was the, the, the size of it. Um, it was essentially 13,500 people uh, were uh, studied in quite detail. Um, they, uh, after they visited the clinic and undertook a standardised medical evaluation, which is what this clinic did, and then after a week or so, um, members were uh, mailed a second questionnaire, which was asked to look at their, their background. Uh, so this included questions about childhood abuse and exposure to forms of child household dysfunction while growing up. And essentially, um, the, risk, the rate of response was very high, roughly 70% um, of the people uh, Responded, so they had essentially nine and a half thousand people out of the thirteen and a half thousand that this um, clinic had seen between August and November of nineteen ninety five. Um, so specifically, they were looking at adverse childhood events. So um, just to be really clear on that, specifically psychological abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, violence against mother. Uh, living with uh, household members who were substance abusers, mentally ill or suicidal, or had been imprisoned. Uh, so the number of categories of these um, ACEs was then compared to a measure of adult risk behaviour, health status and disease uh, as adults. Um, and they were able to get an extremely accurate picture of that because um, the Kaiser Centre was a health evaluation centre that uh, completed very detailed uh, health assessments. So they were able to get an extremely clear picture of uh, the health of people who had experienced adverse child events. Um, and not surprisingly, the results were pretty clear. And I think we would probably, on a on an inst you know, just on a general level, understand the link between childhood trauma and poor mental health. Um, so we would naturally understand anxiety and depression, poor self-image, uh, feelings of worthlessness, suicidal ideation, and poor effective regulation. Um, so now this. And now, out of those things, the most probably the most important aspect of that is the poor effect of regulation, because 
essentially what that means is the person has difficulty controlling their mood, so they, they can be seen as quite explosive. The idea is the this is the sort of person that people think, oh, he goes from zero to 100 um, without a lot of warning. Um, and this has obviously a considerable impact on uh, employment. Uh, it's very difficult to maintain um, uh, employment if you're constantly flying off the handle at your boss or your colleagues or customers. It has obviously has significant impact on uh, relationships uh, and tend and it would greatly increase the chance of sort of violence within uh, intimate part towards intimate partners. Uh, it also has impact on uh, your ability to to study uh, and complete education courses because again, you, you can't maintain a place in a classroom or a tertiary institution or apprenticeship um, if you're constantly firing off the hand on the idea. Uh, behind that is that um, somebody with who has experienced trauma isn't really going from zero to a hundred in moments. They probably the reality is they most likely sit around the eighty mark. If you think of sort of hundred being that kind of explosive anger, um, they sit much much higher due to the high levels of anxiety they experience. So a person with uh, high levels of trauma in their background is constantly scanning their environment for threats, is, uh, has uh, what you'd call an exaggerated start or a reflex. So, you know, if a door gets slammed or, you know, someone makes a loud noise or, you know, something unexpected happens, they're going to really um, uh, jump quite markedly. Um, and the other problem that a lot of people with trauma face is that their threat and interpretation is, is quite skewed. So um, what I or someone who doesn't have a trauma background would see as quite a, a normal interaction, somebody with a trauma background may misinterpret that uh, as, uh, as quite threatening, and then they will go into this uh, highly reactive, defensive uh, mode, which clearly has significant impacts on uh, their uh, relationships and their surroundings. So this sort of uh, psychological impacts of trauma is, I think, quite well understood. I mean, going back to the original quote, I mean, if someone is uh, immersed in um, misery and suffering, it is certainly going to have an impact. And, um, you know, if they come from a background where they are somebody is constantly told that they're worthless and that is uh, reinforced by um, the actions of people that are there to care for them, uh, then it's no surprising that they're going to have uh, all of these psychological ideas, um, you know, sort of anxiety, poor self-image, worthlessness, and obviously the uh, effect of re re uh, regulation. However, what was probably a lot more uh, not as well known was the impact of childhood trauma on physical health. Um, so the study clearly demonstrated that, um, you know, people with a trauma background were a significant uh, risk of ongoing psychological problems as well as, which included substance abuse. Uh, alcohol, IV drug use when compared to the general population. But he also demonstrated that there were um, very considerable links between poor physical health and tra childhood trauma. Uh, and he concluded that people who grew up in an abusive environment were significantly more likely to experience ischemic heart disease, cancers, stroke, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and other disabilities. And we'll come to a nice diagrammatic um, slide of that shortly, um, but he just expanded on this research by using the example of smoking. Um, because one of the outcomes of Felitti's study was that uh, there was a significant correlation between uh, smoking 
and uh, childhood trauma. And there is some research that suggests that nicotine is um, has some benefits in terms of people regulating their mood. Uh, so, for example, people who are depressed are more likely to smoke and tend to smoke chronically. And this is certainly um, my experience in a psychiatric hospital. The number of people that smoke um, is pretty much 100%. Um, I've heard people say to me, you know, oh, look, the cigarette, it's better than lorazepam. Um, and the number of issues that we have around smoking are, are huge because of, and there is the sort of a behavioral explanation behind why people smoke. Um, so he found that obviously the number of, uh, higher number of categories of, of um, experiences increased this likelihood of smoking by age 14. It's quite significantly. Um, so smoking, which is viewed as a significant health problem, may, from the perspective of the person smoking, represent a quick way to help them feel better. Therefore, the solution of, to how they're feeling leads on to chronic smoking. And decades later, this solution leads on to emphysema, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So, um, so essentially, the coping mechanism for the uh, difficulties that somebody with a trauma background experiences uh, has very negative consequences for themselves uh, in later life. Uh, the smoking, of course, isn't uh, the only um, uh, coping strategy that, that traumatized people use. I think probably the most um, uh, likelihood is of someone is, is alcohol and uh, substance use and obviously then it's the same sort of pattern and change so the uh, somebody feels absolutely terrible so they start using substances and um, that because it helps them to feel better because and then that leads on to sort of chronic use which then leads on to uh, addictions and the social pro social and physical problems that uh, those uh, issues that go along with those issues um, and of course on, on to uh, early death as well so um, getting down into the more sort of um, specific biology of trauma um, it sort of looks a little bit like this. So uh, smaller volume of prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, uh, chronic activation of the HPA axis and high CRH levels in the central in CSF, elevation of inflammation levels. So clearly, you know, that leads to um, increased risk for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, asthma, and chronic lung disease, and uh, reduced telomere length, which re uh, goes to um, accelerated aging. Um, so looking at um, particularly the def defects in declarative memory, now this to me is probably one of the more important aspects here because declarative memory is the part of our memory that lets us, enables us to uh, recall facts and figures and data. So if you have significant defects in there, it's going to make learning extremely uh, difficult. So for example, if somebody is going to struggle to uh, remember uh, information that a teacher is um, giving them. They're going to struggle uh, to learn on the job. They're going to struggle uh, in a whole range of settings, which is requiring of them to, to remember stuff. So trying to learn, for example, how to do a, um, a new job is going to be extremely difficult. Um, and just on that, in terms of sort of specific responses, um, bearing that in mind, that if you're trying to do uh, some therapeutic work with somebody with an extreme trauma background, they're going to struggle to uh, memorize the information that they've been given. They're going to struggle to remem remember appointment dates. They're going to struggle to remember to do, I guess, therapeutic homework. And um, just thinking about ways that you can help to manage that uh, will be very helpful. Um, so this just 
sort of, I think this next slide sort of really sums up the um, impact of trauma in a very neat diagrammatic uh, manner. So essentially, a person experiences adverse childhood experiences. Uh, there is a resulting social, emotional, and cognitive impairment uh, that results in the adoption of high-risk behaviours, uh, smoking, uh, substance use, risky sexual behaviours, uh, overeating, um, which then become chronic ways of coping, leading on to disease, disability, and social problems, uh, and resulting in uh, early death. Um, so just now, one of the, the interesting things about trauma is that how a person responds to it is highly, highly individualistic. Um, so again, if we look back at my earlier example, my mother, when she um, um, was in a similar situation to my mother, or she went on to develop uh, a, a relatively mild PTSD and found going back to supermarkets extremely difficult, whereas my mother-in-law, Joan, um, had no sort of particular um, issues at all. Um, but a really... Probably a more extreme example of this was a young person, or you know, a young man who was on my caseload, and he came from possibly the worst trauma background that I've heard of. But he didn't actually suffer that much from that, um, in that he was able to rationalise and explain the trauma in his own mind because um, he would take the blame for much of what his sisters did or would deliberately antagonize his father when he came home intoxicated because that um, was when the, the abuse would occur. So in his so in, in, in effect he was uh, protecting his sister. So their experience was quite different from his, but um, his so, and so they didn't have the same sort of trauma kind of, uh, and the, the trauma that they had, his brother experienced was quite different to, um, to his, but he was able to kind of rationalize it. So it is important to bear in mind uh, that sometimes trauma, they may have a traumatic trauma background, but the impact is not as extreme as um, you might think so, but just so that is an important sort of take home point that it is highly individualistic and um, comes down to the individual and the Dunedin study has done a lot of work around looking at people from a trauma background who don't have a sort of a trauma complex and those that do and what were the factors that um, kept them safe and protected them from developing these sort of um, very uh, poor outcomes in life. So looking at uh, the New Zealand um, context, so in New Zealand we have an additional layer to the general trauma of, which is different to uh, the adverse childhood experience, and this is the impact that colonisation has had uh, for Māori. Um, and a lot of people who have investigated trauma have not included the impact of, uh, of colonisation, which is different from adverse childhood experiences because it becomes a more of a, a collective experience that is uh, cross-generational because the trauma is uh, handed down from generation to generation and can be ongoing because of... Um, matters like um, institutional racism, or another word for that is um, uh, institutional bias. Um, so a lot of Indigenous researchers, um, particularly those in the United States, talk about uh, a historical trauma response, uh, and they um, delineate this in a number of ways. There's the first, there's the uh, the mass trauma experience when uh, the dominant group subjugates uh, a population. Uh, so, for example, as uh, 
uh, in the New Zealand context, more and more European settlers arrived. Um, slowly, the indigenous Māori population were displaced um, and resulting in uh, segregation, displacement, uh, physical and psychological violence, economic destruction and cultural dispossession. So essentially, so in the New Zealand context, we had um, the land wars, uh, which ended up uh, seeing, uh, well, a large uh, a flood of land being alienated from uh, the Māori, uh, from Māori ownership. Uh, and then on top of that, then there was sort of legal attacks on Māori through the land courts, which saw more and more, uh, again, more land uh, being alienated from Māori ownership. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, legally legal protections that were um, built into, for example, the Treaty of Waitangi and the uh, 1870 uh, Constitutional Act, New Zealand Constitutional Act, um, were simply set aside. So um, protections that were uh, built into uh, the legal framework were simply not exact enacted and uh, led to uh, ongoing uh, land alienation. Uh, there's the sort of the physical psychological violence, and that would be considered psychological violence, this alienation with a sense that the legal systems that are there to uh, protect and support citizens are there uh, instead to alienate you from your land, uh, which then led on to economic um, impact uh, and, and cultural dispossession, which is, again, the idea the, uh, of um, your particular culture being um, seen as very uh, secondary and uh, oppressed. So we have, for example, the um, idea of people uh, being punished for speaking Māori, um, in schools uh, and the um, act of quashing of, um, of anything, sort of uh, the culture of the indigenous people. Uh, and then there's a second a trauma response is elicited um, in the first or primary generation that considers physical, social and psychological response. And then the, the responses are transmitted to subsequent generations by various pathways. Um, so essentially, colonization sees colonization in Aotearoa. And I think um, we tend to think that somehow the colonization of Aotearoa was uh, somehow different from uh, other countries, uh, particularly, say, for example, Australia and the United States. Um, and you can argue that certainly the colonization of the US was um, actively genocidal um, and to, uh, to a lesser degree in Australia. Um, it, it would be hard to argue that in New Zealand that it was deliberately genocidal, but the ultimate impact uh, had the same effect. Uh, and the result of colonisation were catastrophic and ongoing, which saw um, over the decades from first contact a population loss on a huge scale, loss of economic base, uh, loss of mana, a loss of political influence, loss of culture and loss of language, um, resulting in a, a highly traumatised um, population. And it's also important to realise that um, the legacy um, has, has lingered for Māori over the generations um, as they've experienced systematic institutional bias, uh, white supremacist attitudes and ongoing racism. And I had to really think quite hard about whether I included that term white supremacist um, because it is quite a, a controversial term. And I think in the end, I decided that I would leave it in because I don't think that the people that came to New Zealand as settlers were white supremacists in themselves. I think essentially they were trying to uh, escape uh, uh, the, uh, an appalling uh, and suppressive class structure of the United Kingdom, which had resulted in extreme poverty and hardship, and they just wanted to escape. But I definitely think that the people 
uh, behind the settlement of New Zealand, who were driving the settlement and had the vision of how Aotearoa New Zealand was going to look, were very much white supremacist. And the idea that there would be a culturally vibrant, uh, economically strong and politically influential indigenous group uh, within that um, structure was abhorrent to them. They very clearly viewed uh, European ideas and our European culture as superior to, um, uh, to those of indigenous people, non-European people. Um, and it's also important to realize that this legacy isn't really uh, in the far off past. Um, for example, uh, going back to the end of the First World War, um, um, returning Māori servicemen were uh, explicitly banned from um, the rehab uh, farms that were do um, that were uh, that European servicemen were able to go into a ballot form a ballot for at the end of the, a similar sort of thing happened in at the end of the Second World War though this wasn't quite so. Um, uh, deliberate. There was more effort was put in to ensure that there was more equality for um, uh, returning servicemen, of, uh, sorry, Māori servicemen, but the end result was very much the same. Uh, roughly 10% of um, European servicemen returning um, got uh, farms out of the um, ballot, whereas less than one, uh, between 1% and 2% of Māori uh, servicemen uh, were um, able to secure farms. So uh, a significant difference in outcomes. Uh, then, of course, there's the, um, the destruction of Māori um, land. Uh, for example, there was a really good example of this during the 1952 uh, visit from the Queen, uh, whereby uh, there was a, a marae that was on the route from the airport that was considered an eyesore and it was simply demolished. Uh, there's also ongoing uh, institutional racism, for, for example, sporting contact uh, within um, sports groups uh, and really clearly set out in the way the NZ, um, RFU, the rugby union, went along with um, the uh, no Māoris uh, to be selected to tour South Africa, which um, it's just a, a craven um, uh, apology to to racism, and they simply didn't have the bottle to um, to stand up to that uh, until there was massive protests uh, from both Māori and uh, New Ze and um, well across all aspects of New Zealand society. Um, then, of course, there's the response from government to, uh, for example, Bastion Point. Uh, which was um, a, a, a disputed to a land from Ngāti Whātua. The land was originally uh, leased to central government during, um, I think, the Russian scare to be used for military purposes. But uh, when that scare was over, the, the land was simply sold. But the way uh, the government of the time uh, responded to the, um, the, uh, the occupation of Bastion Point with a considerable violence and oppression uh, is, is just part of the legacy of colonisation. So we're not talking about events of the distant past. We're talking about events that um, certainly someone of my generation and age would remember very well and would experience them. Um, and certainly um, uh, my parents, would, if I were Māori, would remember these very clearly. I mean, a great example, of course, is the, the dawn raids, um, which... Um, extremely uh, traumatizing for the uh, Pacific culture. So, so given there's well-established links between adverse childhood experience and for Māori, the additional trauma of colonization, it is highly likely that the chronically unwell complex person who is sitting in front of you uh, has, has had experienced considerable levels of major trauma. So, we now are going to sort of narrow it down a little bit and start looking at um, more specific trauma-informed approaches. So there's different ways of looking at it. For example, there's a um, 
a, a systemic approach, which looks at more sort of uh, organisations. And this happens when all people at all levels have an understanding of how trauma affects peoples, groups, organisations and communities as well as individuals, is linked to coping strategies and plays a role in mental and substance disuse disorders and how trauma is addressed in prevention, treatment and recovery settings uh, and is not confined to behavioural health specialty service sector. Um, and I think what that is talking about, so for example, sort of Department of Corrections uh, and uh, youth justice centres uh, deal with uh, the vast majority of people who are in those, uh, under their care, uh, experience trauma. Um, and it is behoven on those uh, institutions and organisations to have a, a trauma-informed care and, and change the way they uh, go about things. Um, so an example um, for me is, I guess, in my own sort of personal um, journey is really changing my attitudes to uh, the delivery of mental health, for example. And there are certain um, things that occur in mental health, uh, for example, restraint in the use of a seclusion that, um, you know, I have really changed my uh, opinion about and changed the way I do them. And we'll, we'll come to that a little bit later. So moving on to, again, sort of more specific um, uh, aspects of trauma-informed care. And the first thing is that there is a realisation that trauma is widespread and, uh, under, and you understand the potential paths for recovery. Uh, it recognises the signs and symptoms of trauma in clients, families and staff and others involved with the system and responds by fully integrating knowledge about trauma in, uh, to policies, procedures and practices. And this is probably the thing that um, touches me the most and is actively resistive of re-traumatisation. So for example, in mental health, we do end up restraining people and we do use seclusion. Um, and I have to say that coming from a forensic background, um, seclusion is used more frequently and more for longer periods. And um, I've had to really rethink how I care for somebody who is being secluded. And I have to work very, and I work very actively to get someone out of seclusion as fast as possible, which does in some cases put me at odds with um, uh, some colleagues. But this whole, I think that if, is the absolute bottom line. And I think if you go back to a, ethical framework of doing no harm is one of your sort of primary underscoring and um, informants of your care, re-traumatising somebody, working hard not to re-traumatise somebody is extremely important. Um, so essentially, in summary, trauma-informed care uh, is about understanding the widespread nature of trauma and recognising how trauma affects people's lives, both physically and mentally. It recognises the potential of people to heal, uh, and it's very person-centred because, um, as we've talked about, individuals respond to trauma very, very differently. Um, one person may be traumatised by something, whereas that doesn't particularly traumatic for another, um, and is... So coming up with a care plan uh, for that is per extremely person-centred and individualised is, is a, uh, an integral part of um, trauma uh, recovery. Uh, and it creates a culture that promotes healing and empowerment. Um, and essentially, I think, if you look at this next slide here, um, sort of the five principles of trauma-informed care, sort of safety, transparency, trustworthiness, 
So it should really be six now that I look a bit at that, but uh, the documentation, the, the research does talk about the five, choice, collaborate, or well, seven now that I notice it, collaboration and mutuality and empowerment. Um, and these may seem obvious, but it's about creating an environment that is the polar opposite of the damaging, toxic, and, tra um, and trauma-inducing one that brought around the damage in the first place. Um, you know, for, for many people, um, you know, safety isn't a given. Um, when I worked for youth forensic, um, there were youngsters that living on, who, who were living on the streets. And, and, you know, my comment to them was, well, isn't that really dangerous? And they said, well, it's safer than being at home. And obviously transparency and trustworthiness, you know, creating um, uh, a relationship that is... Um, open and really honest and really straight up. I mean, I don't think there is anything wrong with saying, no, we can't do that. But it's better to be really um, upfront about what you can and can't do than sort of funds fudge the issue. And I think trustworthiness and tra uh, is built up by being really straightforward. And obviously choice, um, again, because um, not one treatment modality suits everybody. So having a variety of options uh, that uh, people can choose from is uh, incredibly important. And a, and, a, and a sense of working together, that you're in this um, for the long term, that you have the person's back, um, you know, it's really important that you're there on their side, that you're not, um, you know, there to uh, harm them in any way, that, you know, you are walking alongside them, that you, you are very much supporting them. And... Empowerment is really also is extremely important because if you think about it again, trauma and the sort of toxic environment of the trauma of some of these people is very disempowering. Um, for many people, they have simply have no choice and they have to simply tolerate uh, the abuse that is being dished out to them. Uh, and so empowerment, again, very simply can be a, a matter of giving choices that you can choose to do this or you cannot choose to do this. Um, so, you know, trauma-informed care can be as simple as, you know, the workspace in your clinic um, based on, you know, is, is set up around these principles, but can be also much wider and extending to the broader community you know, especially when thinking of the, the trauma of colonisation and the, and the communities that you work with, because obviously that's going to impact significantly higher in, in uh, populations that are, are um, higher in, in Māori rather than uh, European. So I'm just going to, we're sort of going to end now with just three simple take-home messages. Um, first of all, it is a paradigm shift in thinking from what is wrong with you to what has happened to you, um, That, which is a kinder, more compassionate and more empathetic way of thinking. Trauma is widespread, and even the act of asking about trauma helps. It is a, asking about trauma is a therapeutic interaction in itself. Uh, and the research says that even the simple act of acknowledging trauma, asking about a trauma and having uh, and creating an environment that is safe to talk about trauma uh, reduces the number of uh, visits to uh, GPs quite considerably. And finally, this is from a, an academic that I rate extremely highly. His name is uh, Sean Christopher Shea, and he comes to New Zealand quite regularly. Um, and he talks about suicide assessment. But this quote comes from him. Um, he said, the world is a hard place. It is our job to make it a little softer. Uh, and that is what we are doing if we um, are taking into account people's trauma and their adverse childhood experiences. Uh, so thank you for listening. I hope that this has been a useful and uh, informative webinar. And just remember the simple take home message. It's a shift from what is wrong with you to what has happened to you. Thank you for listening.
Well, thank you, John. Um, we don't have any questions at the moment, so I'd just like to encourage people to use that Q&A function. That's a very sensitive and comprehensive and grounded in New Zealand presentation. I think that's been really helpful, John. Thank you. Can you think of any, what are the, what are the common questions that you do get asked that you perhaps haven't had time to address because of uh, your time constraints today? Well, I think really it's often, you know, how is it that uh, trauma affects people physically? That is not, I guess, really sort of, I mean, as I said, we understand kind of the emotional and psychological damage that uh, trauma does. But I think the idea that it can affect people's physical health is not as is, is not as well understood. Um, and that really comes down to the sort of the, the degree of stress hormones that uh, are released over a extended period for people with who are in a in a, a toxic trauma environment, and essentially as people as children develop, their bodies and their brains are awash with cortisol, um, which you know is a stress hormone, and that has a really significant impact on um, their. Uh, both their brain development um, a, as well as uh, their um, ability to manage uh, infection. As, so, um, so specifically in terms of brain development, trauma has extremely uh, adverse impact on the development of uh, the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of our body the brain that helps us self-regulate. And this is where the affective dysregulation comes in. People with a poor, poorly functional frontal cortex have that difficulty in um, self-soothing. So they, they develop that very explosive personality, similar to what you would see with somebody um, who has a, a brain injury. So, um, so in which is you know explains that that very erratic uh, impulsive behavior that you see with people with who have a trauma background um it is also the impact that it has on um our ability to fight off disease you know if it's you know if you think about somebody who for example athletes is a really good example i know um you know i used to be involved in sport to to quite a high level and the number of like I guess you'd call them elite level athletes that who were training extremely hard that developed um, you know stress related illnesses like glandular fever you know it was quite common um, well, that's very similar to somebody who experiences trauma uh, their their immune system over time becomes compromised by the degree of stress that they are constantly experiencing so their ability to fight off um, illness you know colds and flu. Uh, is compromised, so they they get sicker. They get sicker than the general population, and they get uh, sicker more frequently, which has an impact on schooling um, and across their uh, their lifespan. So I think that's probably one of the the more uh, important aspects of trauma is that not only does it affect psychological health, it affects uh, physical health as well. We do have some questions now, John. Oh, lovely. Thank you. I thought, I thought it might happen. <laughs> so um, how do you see this approach, your approach that you've described today, connecting to the Mental Health Act and its use? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Uh, yeah, and, and as a DAO, you, you know, I'm involved a lot with people putting people being put under the Mental Health Act, which is... I've been disempowering and very much against, I guess, trauma informed care, which is about empowerment and choice. Because when you are put, putting someone under a compulsory treatment order, you're taking away those choices and disempowering people. But I guess it, it's how you go about doing it, um, that process. And so the first thing is, particularly if I'm working with a Māori family, I will always take a, you know a, 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 a Pukinga Artify with me who are uh, Māori cultural and uh, Māori health workers, and they can help me and the whānau that I'm working with work through that process. Um, and in my practice, I work extremely hard not to use the Mental Health 
effect. And I can think of a number of examples, particularly um, where I've, you know, gone through a really, really long process of trying to persuade the person to come into hospital voluntarily. Um, it hasn't worked because the person was really um, so unwell that they couldn't really make the choice. But because I went through a really careful, considered um, process with the family and involved them with e in every step of the way, you know, they, they could see that the use of a compulsory treatment was kind of inevitable. And they actually, in the end, you know, agreed that, that this was our only option because they wanted their son treated and, you know, could see that we'd work really hard to, um, to, to try to get that without using the Mental Health Act, you know, with the, all its disempowering um, legalities. Um, so, you know, the, the process we went through was very, um, quite soft and gentle and highly collaborative. So we worked really closely with the whole Fano in trying to, uh, you know, get the outcome that was the least restrictive for their son. But in the end, um, we weren't able to do that due to the level of unwellness. But because we'd gone through a really, really good process with them, yeah. uh, they they went, you know, they they accepted this outcome. And then when the police arrived um, again, you know, I think. My experience of the police is that they're changing their attitudes quite a lot. They know the role of the duly authorised officer and they listen to them quite um, quite well and look for guidance um, from them. And I was able to, and they, the, the two that turned up, you know, I spoke to them, I said, explain the situation and, you know, like this, you know, explain that this person's not an antisocial person, he's not aggressive, he's just really unwell. You know, so you guys need to go in really carefully. And it was actually extremely gratifying as how well they managed to do that. Um, so using, you know, the, that trauma-informed care approach of, you know, sharing the process um, and working collaboratively with the family, using cultural advisors, you can, um, I think, mitigate some of the harsher aspects of the Mental Health Act you know, which again, you know, comes back to making the world a slightly softer place. Right. Thank you. Um, another question is, how can you spot the difference between ADHD and people with high ACES? I find this difficult because the presentation is very similar in yeah. terms of working yeah. memory. And, yeah. Um, when I was working, and it, it, look, when I was working with uh, youth forensic the highly traumatized kids that we saw, they would have a cluster of diagnoses. Um, it would be um, like an oppositional defiance type diagnosis, query autistic spectrum disorder, query ADHD. Um, and because the way they were behaving sort of resembled bits and pieces of all those diagnoses. So it was almost like... A, 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 a syndrome, really, I guess, where they had bits and pieces of various diagnoses. Um, and it is very difficult to, to sort of tease out the, um, the, the, the aspects that are trauma-related and those aren't. And I guess in terms of specifically ADHD, I, I guess the really the most simple and obvious way of... Um, deciding whether you're looking at someone with a trauma background or this is just straight up ADHD is bringing up trauma um, with the person and their family. You know, what did you experience growing up? Um, you know, and just being a little, being quite brave and um, ruling out trauma um, because they, they do look very similar. You've got the, the very impulsive behaviour, the explosiveness, the... Um, the, the rapid movements. Um, yeah. So yes, they, they do look very similar. But so I guess the, the clearest and simplest way is very simply just ruling out trauma by um, inquiring about it and ruling that out. Thanks. And we've got a, a, a comment for you. And Tara is saying, thank you, John. And she's saying number six is peer support. She just, uh, and she also wanted to say that Leonie Farmer and uh, sorry, Leonie Pihama and Linda 
to hear why Smith have some good research on aspects. Absolutely, of yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yes, the, the role of the peer support worker, that um, is quite newish the last few years, and that's certainly um, becoming more and more widespread. And the work that the peer support workers are doing is, is quite tremendous. If you ever have the opportunity uh, to talk to or hear or have any sort of interaction with a guy called Dean Rangahua, uh, Dean is started life as a, um, um, what did he start off as? As a, uh, a consumer advisor at Tilmorton Hospital. And Dean now is a consumer advisor to the Minister of Health. He works at an extremely high level. Um, he's been involved he, with the, the most recent um, uh, Royal Commission of Inquiry into Mental Health. He also sits on the board of Tapo, and he's a phenomenal, phenomenal man. Um, and he, but he talks widely about the role of peer support workers, and he is well worth sitting down and listening to if you ever get the chance. But certainly the, the role of the peer support worker is a, a critical one uh, and again you know it's about that empathy and understanding and lived experience um, and, and valuing that role as well so sometimes um, if you're in a, a I guess in a, a role that has uh, connotations of authority um, people may be very wary of you and perhaps are unlikely to open up to you to the same degree as someone with who is um, you know, in a, in a more peer, in a, a peer support role, so they're more likely. There's a chance that they'll be more like much more open with them. So definitely, the role of the peer support worker uh, is extremely important. Absolutely. Um, Thank you. One other thing too, in terms of um, trauma informed care, is is taking care of yourself. Um, you know that vicarious trauma. Um, the idea that, that that stuff it really does get in. Um, there are a number of ways of keeping yourself safe. Um, obviously, probably the, the two most valuable one is, well, the most valuable one is clinical supervision, you know, getting it off your chest. And that can happen, and I think supervision can take place both in an informal way, for example, with, you know, your designated um, clinical supervisor, but it can also happen informally with colleagues and friends. Um, and I don't know if this is useful, but I have a, a particular strategy that um, I use, which um, I find um, so when I first started my career, um, I found hearing about trauma extremely difficult and very, very distressing. Um, so the, the technique that I've developed, I mean, I, I like um, science fiction. So um, I sort of envisaged um, like um, a person wearing like an armored space suit um, and the the information coming from the person like as a as a laser beam hitting uh, my armored space suit and, and bouncing off and over the years initially you know it was like I, I would go through quite a process you know of the the boots going on the trousers and everything sort of and it hit, it's quite involved you know the noise the noises of everything clicking in and finally the helmet going on and um, you know, and now I just imagine myself wearing it, and it, it, it's like a visual reminder in my head not to um, to take this stuff in. Um, and I found that effective. That's a, a strategy that I use. I mean, um, it, it might not work for everybody, but it certainly works for me. So, sort of giving the information a, a visual kind of. Um, uh, visualizing it and then it not going in and visualizing yeah. it bouncing yeah. off is an effective yeah. strategy for me yeah that's really useful thank you john well look at time has uh, we, we should really pull the session to a close it's four four minutes past two and we've oh one more question has come in let's have a look oh just thanks john lots of good points covered and uh, for the websites i've i've just copied all those websites that you were recommending yeah. So people have got them and they, they've been able to copy those off. Oh, great. So just very quickly on those websites, probably the best two are the Weary Workforce and Tapo. The uh, Dunedin Study work, uh, website um, is 
the, the material is extremely complex and dense, and it took me a long time to even understand some of the titles. Um, but the Tapo and the Weary Workforce, they are, um, I think, a lot more user friendly. Um, so, yeah, those are really, really good starts. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us again. I hope uh, the rest of your day is, is fruitful. And um, look forward to seeing you again.